Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Vladimir, and it's time for another interview on the Architecture Weekly YouTube channel. Today, I'm speaking with Dominic Torno. He is the author of the Thinking in Distributed Systems book. Uh, you can uh, you can purchase it online. Uh, we will leave the link to that, uh, of course. Uh, he also has uh, the weekend a newsletter about the distributed systems called the weekend read and i'm a fan uh, i'm a personal fan and today we have a chance to spend an hour speaking about distributed systems its history problems and so on so welcome dominic hey thank you very much good morning super excited to be here yeah me as well uh, super happy to, to have you here so uh let's start with uh, talking about uh the book uh, how many chapters do you already have so uh, I am eight chapters in, so there are still uh, four chapters uh, to complete. I basically started this year in January 2023, and it is uh, one chapter a month. Okay, okay. So it's all about distributed systems. Yeah, it's all about distributed systems and uh, thinking in distributed systems, because I do believe that there is a, there is a fundamental difference between uh, knowledge about something and actually truly understanding something. And uh, for understanding something, I am also a, um, a believer in um, strong mental models. And um, there are many different mental models, right? Like when it comes to distributed systems, even when it comes to like specific aspects of distributed systems, there are many different mental models. They are basically like ways of thinking about something. And I enjoy having a variety of uh, different mental models because that allows me to understand uh, specific aspects uh, in its entirety. There, there is this notion or there is a story of the blind man and the elephant, right? Where you have like a, a set of blind men, seven blind men, and they all or blindfolded men, and they all touch the touch the elephant. And depending on what part they touch, they they imagine it is something different, right? So somebody touching the trunk will think that the entire gestalt looks different from somebody who uh, touches the tail. But only if you if you touch it all the way around, right? Then eventually you piece that image of oh, this is what an elephant looks like. You piece that together in your head. And so I'm, uh, I enjoy a lot of different mental models because each of these gives me a lens um, or glasses that I can see the world through. And uh, I try to capture that in the book. That's why it's not called distributed systems. That's why it's called thinking in distributed systems. Oh, okay. So this is, uh, th this reminds me about this uh, views and viewpoints when you look at the software architecture and you cannot have uh, a single view on this because it's like too complicated and uh, is not useful at all. But instead, you have like different views or models of the system, so that you can comprehend different properties of it. Exactly. It is uh, that is also um, uh, it's like yeah, that is a good articulation of the uh, of the um, of the whole issue. Although I want to say that uh, that particular one, if I'm not mistaken, it propagates four different or um, is a, a proponent of four different types uh, of models. I'm a little less rigid in that. So it's like I, I basically enjoy a variety of uh, different uh, different models and not like specific types of them. Although we do come back to the to the same models very often because it's just the nature of distributed systems and software systems in general. Uh, when we're speaking about mental models, do you have any examples of that? So the whole notion of mental models is actually very, uh, it comes, uh, it's very uh, prevalent in education and also in, in physics. When we need to start thinking about things that we cannot directly observe, Right. And then um, you may uh, remember in school when you started thinking or when when your teacher like actual school school, right, not university, but in school, when your teacher started talking about atoms right, as the smallest building blocks and then um, they maybe draw an atom on the chalkboard or then maybe they have a model of it and it's usually a sphere. Right. So we have this one one sphere. So this is our first 
mental model where we where we start like seeing the world um the world of the smallest through that lens but then eventually we realize that it actually gets us far right we can think very far in this term but uh eventually it breaks down and uh then we think of okay um we have a we we acquire a different mental model now and that mental model is then uh, often you have the um core of an atom and that is um surrounded by electrons right and um it's not just a refinement eventually we are actually uh, um not just refining we are changing the mental model so the idea of the core uh, being very small in the center of the atom surrounded by electrons gets us further again eventually we have to think of okay this is actually not how it works it is more of a probability where the electron is in uh, in in a certain uh, in a certain moment in time and then we're adding more properties to that so for example then uh, certain particles have a charge, an electrical charge, right? Okay, we all are kind of familiar with electrical charges, but then we need to add more properties. So for example, spin, right? And then we we take we talk to kids spin as like, oh, the particle spins around its, its center, right? But uh, then eventually we also uh, drop that mental model and understand, well, a spin is something that is inherent to, uh, to a particle that does not relate to anything that we are used in our macroscopic world, right? And so we have uh, many, many different mental models that we can draw from and use in certain situations. Sometimes thinking about an atom as like being one uh, uh, sphere uh, one solid sphere, totally fine, right? And in other in other cases, we need to think about it in very very uh, fine grained terms, uh, where we have uh, where we have kernels surrounded by electrons uh, that are um, uh, more like described probabilistically with many different properties, like not only charge but also spin that we usually do not observe. So, and uh, the same is true for for um, software engineering. It is while atoms are material, we can still not interact with them, right? So we cannot directly observe them. We cannot we cannot interact with them. And the uh, same is true for software systems. We, uh, we can actually not interact with them, right? So it's like, um, on the one side, there is a code, but code is not the software system, right? We usually say the code is the truth, but is it? Yeah, so the code is a static system. Clearly, a software system is a, dynam a dynamic system because we're interested in its behavior, right? So the code is really just a blueprint or the description for the machine, uh, how it needs to behave. So in and, our and, head... And, and, and by, by the way, not, not for the whole system, but, but for different parts and not yes, all of them. And exactly. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't depict the collaboration between those parts at all. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and then uh, we are looking at something that's also absolutely fascinating: emergent properties, right? Properties that cannot be traced back to an individual component of a system, but they only emerge from their uh, interactions, right? So, if you think about it, for example, scalability and reliability is not a component property because one component can't be indefinitely scalable. And one component cannot even um, um, uh, uh, stomach one crash fall, right? So where does scalability and reliability come from? Right? It comes from the set of components and their interactions, the way that the system is composed. So reliability and scalability is an emergent property. And coming back to that um, that idea that a software system is immaterial. So now me even saying the system is composed of components that only exists in our head, right? Because uh, at the at the uh, end of the day, uh, I cannot open the computer and say these are the individual components, right? This is like this is my front end, this is my back end, this is my authentication component, this is my database, right? They are not physical components. We think about the system as if it was composed from these individual components, and there is our mental model. Yeah, but at the same time, you you can still think of some of the components as physical things because even if that's a cloud-provided authentication component 
like in the worst case scenario you can just uh, get in the car and drive to the office of the company that is providing you that so you'd still to, to some extent touch those components but it's still mm -hmm. very hard and it's not practical at all right so hardware is for sure a physical component right but uh, the hardware is not the software Right. The hardware is the execution environment for the software. And you're absolutely right. We have to trace it all back uh, to the hardware. And uh, once we cross all of these layers of abstraction, we will always end up at uh, the hardware layer. The hardware behaves as if it was composed of uh, many different components. A good example of, the, of that as if relationship is already at the very low level in the cloud providers where I have a hardware a component um, a machine, right? That behaves as if it was multiple machines, right? So virtualization, uh, it's like many uh, virtual machines. But if I open up that machine, it's not that there are more machines in it, right? So it just behaves as if multiplexing in that case. Yeah, that, that's a nice example. Okay. Uh what inspired you to write this book? So um, on the one side, you can say my greatest strength in life is uh, underestimating any challenge, like any other good developer, right? Saying how hard can it be? So uh, turns out it can actually be hard. It's like I am, I am looking forward to the day where my weekends are not entirely consumed by uh, writing a book. But uh, the underlying the underlying motivation there was uh, my my uh, fascination really with uh, with uh, distributed systems. I do enjoy like reading about distributed systems, studying distributed systems, learning about different mental models, learning about the different ways of thinking about them and their intricacies and pitfalls and the philosophy behind something like uh, emergent properties. I enjoy that very, very much. And then I also wanted to capture some of that joy in the book. Okay, and that's, that's a great mission. Uh, how would you explain a concept of distributed system to somebody who doesn't have any technical background whatsoever, to, to a lawyer, for example? Oh, okay. So in that case, um, I like to draw from uh, the physical world. So in uh, one um, analogy that I use in the preface of the book is an office building, where um, it, it's granted, it's a little bit of a sad office building, because everybody has an office. And uh, the office, there are no co-workers in your office. And there is no window in your office. There is also no phone. Yeah. Uh, there is only one of these old tiny tubes. You uh, remember maybe from the from the movies, right? When we watch the old movies, where they have the in-office mail instead of email. It was physical. And it's these tubes that uh, you can put in a little capsule. And in the capsule is a piece of paper. So and then the tubes all go to a mail room. And there's the mail room attendant. Um, um, uh, taking the tubes uh, that come in and then put them in the in the destination tubes, uh, so to say. And you also have a mail slot to the outside world where you can hand uh, receive and hand off mail. And um, so, in in with that analogy, uh, you can think of a lot. Uh, you can think through a lot of the aspects of distributed systems because if you define a distributed systems as a set of uh, concurrent communicating components and the components uh, communicate uh, via the network. You can see how that very well maps to the office building where the office building, every office worker is um, analogous to the component and the in-office mail is analogous to the uh, network. And uh, now you can start thinking through um, the challenges that the office workers face. So for example, hey, how can we all like go to lunch together, right? And um, so that's actually not like a big problem if um, your uh, coworkers all promise you that they will uh, respond to your uh, request within 10 minutes and uh, the uh, mailroom attendant um, uh, promises you that 
they will not like lose any mail or will not like sort resort or send it to the wrong destination. But um, as soon as a uh, uh, mailroom attendant um, feels uh, like he wants or they want to like pull some pranks, right? And then drop some messages, reorder some messages, delay some messages. Then you see how hard that actually is. So, and uh, with that, I think there's a, the analogy of the distributed of the office building and the problems that you have if you do not have direct communication uh, maps very well to the, the problems you face in distributed systems where compo components can come and go, where the network can reorder messages, duplicate or drop messages. And you basically have to find mitigations for all of these situations in order to still make the best of your predicament. Okay, so if I got you correctly, then the co-workers in this, those build, in this building is uh, are the components of the distributed systems, and they try to do something together by messaging each other, but messages are dropped and uh, the network is unreliable, so you, you face all of, all of those issues. Okay, that's a great analogy. Like I, I haven't heard that before, so but that, that I think that's pretty useful to how think about what what distributed system is actually. Okay, um, you know, in the preface, you can just download the the uh, preface of the book on the on the website, and there is a picture uh, of that office building. And uh, when I need to think through distributed system challenges, I often just look at that picture. Because it basically gives me a, uh, it sets up the rules, right? It sets up the rules of the game. And uh, I need to find the right behavior for, for uh, our workforce in the office building um, to make the best out of their, uh, of their situation. And some outcomes are indeed uh, impossible, whereas um, uh, some outcomes are, uh, some are possible and you have to basically weigh the consequences, advantages and disadvantages for your situation. So that picture alone uh, often helps me think uh, through um, the, the difficulties we face. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, that probably is a great help. Uh, okay, so uh, when we speak about distributed systems, uh, we should recall this, you know, how, how many of them, 10 policies of distributed systems? Uh, what is your mm -hmm. favorite of those? Oh, that is a good question. I think the network is reliable, uh, is my, is my favorite because, um, there are there are more um, so in distributed system we talk about system models right and a system model is basically a set of rules you know? and it it sets up the stage it sets up the 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 board of the game so to say and it gives you the rules and then uh, you have to behave accordingly and you usually you want to win right so you devise a strategy you know? And we have more theoretical system models and we have more practical system models. So the theoretical system models are the ones where usually nothing can go wrong, right? So it's like components don't fail, components are time bound, they always uh, respond in a, in a certain time frame. messages never duplicated, never dropped, never reordered. And um, a lot of like problems, right? A lot of objectives in that game they're very straightforward to achieve, very straightforward. But you throw in message loss, right? Then um, that completely wreaks havoc on your, on your strategy. And the amount of um, like situations that you have to think through just by losing a message is mind boggling. So the, the uh, reality that is thrown at you, right? If you just add message loss is, um, is, is, is uh, like absolutely devastating. And that's why I think that fallacy, the, the notion of um, the network is reliable is, is my favorite. Although the other ones, something like the, the latency is zero and stuff is, is also really good for, for, for a practical, like practically building systems, right? 
just dropping a message when you're really, really in hot water. So that's just fascinating. Yeah, that that breaks like uh, the, the the first uh, immediate model that you would have it breaks it right away. So you yes. you, you, you need to imagine a new one. Um, okay, uh, uh, let's. Uh, take a step back and uh, think about uh, like distributing systems are hard they really try to to test uh, to verify they're expensive uh they bring uh, a lot of troubles to the developers and to the customers uh why do we need distributed systems in the first place why we just can't you know have one single machine and be happy with that you know uh we come back to that notion of emergence and uh I am sure we will all be able to find um, a, a rich set, myriad of reasons, right? Why uh, distributed systems are uh, required or beneficial. But for me, it boils down to uh, exactly two properties. And that is scalability and reliability. So we all expect our systems to be correct. Right? And that is also up to us, how we define correctness. What is acceptable to me may not be acceptable to you. But we uh, that's basically, that's table stakes, right? That is, uh, that is the bottom line. System, system shall be correct. But you can build a correct system on a single node. Not a problem, right? Or, I mean, I don't want to like minimize the, the, the difficulty of that, but let's just argue, not a problem. But um, you cannot make this scalable and you cannot make this reliable because a single component, single node, single machine, whatever our level of abstraction is, can only handle so many requests at a time and it cannot handle a single crash fault. If I pull that plug, it's gone. So therefore I cannot provide um, a, a system that is life. I can still provide a system that is safe that means it will not violate correctness, right? But I cannot provide a system that is life. So uh, scalability and reliability are the driving forces behind distributed systems. Because if we want scalability and we want reliability, we need redundancy. And uh, redundancy is duplication and coordination. And by the way, it's a coordination that is what makes uh, that uh, emergent property happening, right? So where the property of a system is traced not only to the individual components, but uh, to the composition of uh, the components. And that's basically the coordination. So that's why we need distributed systems in order to make sure that we can handle the load and in order to make sure that we can handle failure. Okay, uh, th th those are the major reasons, uh, I suppose. Uh, when we were speaking about uh, the, the, the scandaling the load, uh, what is the maximum, I'm not sure, like capacity of RPS or the, 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 the volume of the database? What we can handle at one node? Is it like two terabytes of data? How much? <laughs> A good question. There's like on 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 that one, I'm I'm out. So besides besides a very unsatisfying answer that it depends, um, <laughs> I unfortunately have no insights to offer. Yeah. However, it does very much depend on the uh, on the nature of your application and on the uh, on the uh, what we generally call access patterns, right? Or what we could also uh, more broadly call the uh, usage patterns or load patterns that uh, your application faces. But uh, yeah, on on that one, on that one, I'm out. I have I have no uh, no insights and especially no hard limits to offer. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, let, let's just continue. So uh, how have distributed systems evolved over the past few decades and what the pivotal moments or technologies that drove those changes? Oh, wow. That is, oh, okay. That's an absolutely fascinating question. You got to stop me at one point because otherwise we spend the, okay, we spend okay. the rest of the time here. So, okay. Where to start? There is, um, so when we look into the history of uh, distributed systems, they uh, evolved from um, concurrent systems, right? So basically where we had si still a single node, but multiple cores, or we still had a, we had a, a single node and uh, introduced uh, concurrency via uh, threading, so time sharing. And while that is sequential, 
on the lower level, it feels like it is uh, parallel on the on the higher level. So, so basically, the, the 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 nature of concurrency. So, and with that, that already introduced a lot of the problems that we uh, now see in distributed systems. Although we still have the luxury of, for example, shared state that uh, multiple threads and now thread not in this in the sense of operating system thread we could also say processes but not in the sense of operating system processes but concurrent actors right uh, can access and therefore they also had the possibility of uh, synchronizing via via shared state something that in distributed systems we uh, generally do not have um, however we could also, and there is a rich, rich history, and there's like a lot of insights, especially a lot of impossibility results. There's a cool paper out there, 100 impossibility results. Um, so uh, impossibility results that basically tell us what is not achievable, right? And we have to work within these boundaries. These are hard boundaries. Yeah? Some of them are more practical than others. Some of them are very, very uh, theoretical, but they are hard boundaries. Right? But we can also look at, for example, a time like uh, 2006, where um, AWS launched the cloud. Right? And then uh, you cannot talk about cloud computing without talking about distributed computing. Right? And with the cloud, the degree of distribution exploded. And um, there is also a super interesting, very, very interesting asymmetry in uh, cloud computing today. The, we have completely figured out as an ecosystem, yeah, we have completely figured out how to provide scale. AWS, Azure, Google, take any other cloud provider. Um, with a single command, you can either provision one virtual machine, 10, 100, a thousand, right? So um, we can provision an almost unlimited amount of resources in fractions of a moment. Yeah? The same is true if you have a beefy Kubernetes cluster, right? With one uh, YAML file, however you feel about YAML, but with one YAML file, you can um, start one container, 10, 100, 1,000. They are all uh, connected uh, in, uh, in the virtual network. So we have completely figured out how to provide scale, but we have not figured out how to consume scale. That is, how do we actually build applications for, uh, for, uh, for these systems? Because it is very different if I write an application for one node or for 10 nodes or for 100 or for 1,000. That is different each and every time. And it's not just quantitatively different, it's qualitatively different. And um, unfortunately, to my regret, as an ecosystem, we tend to have um, like only one idea. And that idea is like, I know, I know, let's pretend that a distributed system is not a distributed system. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite papers from 1994, around the time that uh, the 10 fallacies were published, also um, from the folks at Sun Microsystems, they were ahead of the curve. There is a paper, Notes on Distributed Computing. And they are lamenting in 1994, they're lamenting that we're not learning from our own history and keep pretending that a distributed system is not a distributed system, even though distributed systems are inherently different from non-distributed systems. And in uh, 2023, that is still, uh, it's like a, still a, a, a thought of the strategy where you say, oh yeah, let's pretend that a thousand machines are not thousand machines, but one machine. So that is, uh, that is problematic. Yeah, I, um, I think the main, the main problem here is that uh, the human mind is not adapted to think about like parallel things. Like we, we, we cannot even handle the probabilities properly, right? And this is just a small part of what, what should be applied to understand or comprehend the distributed systems. But thinking in parallel is just completely gone from human brain. So th th that's why the importance of uh, those mental models bring here. And that, that's why we as a human species, we're trying to, you know, to abstract or say like, hey, let's think it's not distributed. What, what's then? So it's kind of in inevitable. It, I mean, I understand the attractiveness of the proposition, 
but uh, and while there is no formal proof that uh, that is that is not possible, I want to say that experience has taught us that um, we are actually not getting the benefits that we are after in the first place if we try to pretend that a hundred nodes are one node. Um, and then, so that is uh, that is uh, one one uh, direction we can we can take that question in. Another direction that is also super interesting to me is the strong link between um, database systems and uh, distributed systems, right? So they also, I want to say, they um, uh, with a uh, like a lot of like room for interpretation, but we can say that they basically grew up together. Right, so it's like they they came about at the same time. Um, they they gained like popularity and also uh, a lot of interest in in um, research and uh, so in academia and in the, in, in the enterprises uh, around the same time. And uh, I am envious, uh, incredibly envious, of uh, database systems because uh, database systems they came up with a um with in my opinion absolutely unmatched abstraction and that is database transactions they change how we think about the world the first major if you ask me the first major abstraction that is almost brain breaking is the abstraction of a operating system process for all of us who have tinkered with like, you know, this, um, uh, what is it? Out of fruit and spark and the, the little microcontrollers you can like program and stuff and do something with it, right? So it's like, I don't know, just like control a little engine, control a light, do things. Uh, they're very sequential, right? So it's, uh, it's basically one loop. It's a main, main event loop. The loop is uh, triggered periodically, go for it, right? So that's, that's what you get, do it. And then you write, and everything you want to do here, right? It's like you you have to do. Yes, you're, you're sitting on the metal. The and embedded systems are usually like for the hobbyists, yeah. So they are simple enough that you can basically do. Okay, now I do step one of process one, step one of process process three uh, to step one of process three. But eventually we can though, or not be. Uh, it's like some very smart people, not me, unfortunately, but I came up with the idea of a process. And a process is a fantastic abstraction. A process gives you the illusion. That's what abstractions are, illusions. A process gives you the illusion that you own the CPU, right? Your application is the only thing running on this computer. And for good measures, we also threw in virtual memory, where it's like, and you have an unlimited amount of memory. Yeah? And mind boggling, yeah, the implication of that, because now I can write my applications like nothing else runs on this machine, right? This is very different from when you uh, start tinkering with, uh, with uh, embedded systems and you have to interweave yeah, the individual, uh, the individual like processes together and mix and max, mash them into one uh, application. It's very, very different. Uh, so it's no, absolutely no, no, fantastic. No, no, now I got what you're saying. If you let me rephrase, so mm -hmm. what you're saying basically is that with with the hardware and the medium controllers, I, I don't have experience with those, unfortunately. But there, like you need to be aware of everything that is happening on the chip. So it's like uh, kind of the complexity on on your shoulders. However, yes. when we just go to to a PC, then all of this burden is weighted out of your shoulders because you you have this illusion of being the only program on the computer, and all the rest is handled handled magically by the operating system. Yes, and now you can be oblivious to that fact, and not only you, but also your code. Not a single line in your code uh, attributes to the fact that you're not running alone. Right, of course, illusions break until, down uh, in the extreme. One second, I, I, until you try to read something from a database and found out that another connection, another process wrote to the same data you're, you're trying to read, and it's like inconsistency. You're welcome to the real world. Yes, so they so illusions break down in the uh, a in the extremes. 
So if I have too many processes, the operating system is basically just busy either scheduling or just says, you know what, I'm not going to schedule your process because I can't do it anymore. Or if I have, if I consume too much memory and even the hard drive is running out, right, then it's like, okay, I can't do it anymore. And by the way, I'm getting really slow anyways, because now I have to page in and page out the memory to and from the hard drive, right? So it degrades a lot. And also in these situations where you say you have two processes, but they ac access the same file, right? It's like, oh, yo, yo. So it only gets you so far, but it gets you very far. And now database transactions come in. And database transactions do uh, basically give us give us the same uh, the same feeling, right? So processes are a promise, a promise to you from that API, promise to you that you don't have to worry about other processes. I gotcha. The uh, transactions are uh, the they make a they they make a similar or they also make a promise, right? As soon as you cross that threshold that says begin transaction, you're stepping into a completely new world. In a world where, for example, partial execution is impossible. Either all of it happens or none of it happens. A world where, depending on your isolation level, but let's uh, assume the highest serializability, um, you get the illusion that nobody else is touching the database the moment you're touching it, all right? You're, you're completely alone. There may be 1 million transactions waiting, you're alone. Right, so it's like it's blissful. None, of, it's uh, you get this cannot fail guarantee in the sense all or nothing. You get this guarantee that um, you're alone. You get this durability guarantee, right? That is, as soon as you tell the client, "I did this," you did this. It's done forever, right? I will never backtrack on my word. So. And uh, also consistency, which is has a little bit of a different quality than uh, AI and D. Um, but so you get this promise, right? And then you do not have to worry about it. And nothing in your SQL statement alludes to the fact that there could be another transaction somewhere around there, right? So it's, or that it could like just execute partially. None of it eludes, uh, it's completely oblivious. <coughs> and we do not have um, uh, the, the same uh, luxury in distributed systems. There is no um, abstraction that is as powerful as transactions because transactions really like are, they pretend or with transactions, you get to pretend that a distributed system is not a distributed system. Yeah, I, I mean, the workflow engines and the, like uh, orchestrators for distributed systems kind of trying to do so, right? So they're saying like, if something fails, I will, uh, revert some of the changes and so on. But this is, like, to my perception, a very fragile guarantee that can actually be broken if you're not careful yes. enough. So, yes, not 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 a guarantee to a full extent. So, yeah, but but we're trying. We we as an industry, we're trying to pretend it's like not distributed, but still. Uh I would say, um, I would say we're not trying that it's not distributed. Uh, I would say we are trying to pretend that a, a node cannot fail, but we're not trying to hide the fact that there are multiple nodes. So, but the, what you're alluding to, I think, is uh, the notion of durable execution, right? And that gains that gains a lot of mind share uh, recently, because um, because of uh, Temporal, the company that I previously uh, worked at. Um, the but the idea is actually much older. So a durable execution is a function execution with strong execution guarantees, right? It gives you the illusion that it cannot fail and it cannot time out. But that comes with a big fat asterisk, right? Where it's like, okay, as you said, we have to be very careful here and we have to do, um, we have to cooperate, right? In order to actually uh, make this happen. One of the big reasons is the actual guarantee you get from these systems, depends how they are implemented, is they guarantee that they will resume or restart, right? So, and that is the only guarantee you get. Right? Um, you don't get anything else, but we will try to resume or we will try to restart. This is a fantastic guarantee, actually, because especially in the face of transient and intermittent errors, 
that you can just push past by just keep retrying is a great guarantee, right? And you can make a lot of things happen with that. But as you said, it's like it can break down in uh, uh, very quickly. Yeah, there's a f- uh, yeah. I I mean, let's continue because like we do do sort of the time consumed and we still have a lot of topics to to discuss. We do. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you believe are the most pressing challenges in distributed systems today? I believe the most pressing challenge is that uh, uh, complexity of building distributed systems um, lies in front of the application developer. Or as you said, we put that complexity on the shoulder of uh, the application developer. Application developers are aware of basically everything. Right. So, and then uh, we have to mitigate all these distributed system challenges. And uh, we write sagas and compensations and event sourcing and CQRS and name your favorite pattern on microservice.io. And we throw that all onto the application developer and say, go do this. Yeah? And uh, the application developers have to do this over and over again. And uh, the the uh, Mac the Mac Frankenstein of, of of distributed systems emerges, right? That is uh, basically wi- hot wired together from from different body parts, right? And uh, yeah, then the then the horror uh, starts. So eventually, you stop smiling, yeah, and you do not enjoy coming back to work the next day uh, because you have this hot mess that deals with mitigating distributed system challenges. And somewhere in there is the kernel of your application logic. So uh, that uh, seems to be pressing. Yeah, yeah the, that's interesting thing. So I are saying that the like, software developers should be focusing on the business logic and making like what business uh, wants and then have some backup from somebody else. I don't know, software architects, somebody else who will solve this distributed problems for them. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, I would phrase it a bit differently. So uh, first off, the uh, the phrase focus on your business logic is a little overused, but there is still truth in that. So uh, basically, the I like to say um, uh, you shall be able to focus on the problem that you want to solve, right? And um, if the problem that you want to solve uh, is a uh, distributed system problem, then of course you get to focus on that. However, if the uh, problem that you want to solve is an, an application level problem, then any distributed system level problem that is in your way is nothing but a nuisance, right? And um, so when we look at database transactions again, they are all processes, but database transactions are really cool. So when we look at database transactions again, there uh, we have a strong abstraction um, that lets the developer focus on the business logic. And there the business logic is basically tables, rows, and columns, right? Whatever you want to do with it, but you get to focus on tables, rows, and columns, uh, select, insert, update, and delete. Yeah. And... Um, the challenges that uh, come with that, the challenges that come with partial execution, for example, are completely taken care of on a platform level, right? Um, thanks to journaling or write ahead logs, database recovery, we will ensure, right, that uh, the transaction either completes uh, or doesn't run at all. Yeah? And uh, we don't have this level of, of comfort for a distributed system. So, and there will always be limits. Yeah? The database, for example, owns its semantics. We know what a write does. Yeah? So we also know how to compensate for a write. We don't know what a general service call does. So we cannot just compensate for a general service call because we don't know how, right? So for example, we have the, the application developer will always have to come up with an idea. How do I ensure consistency? And if compensations are part of that, they always will have to do compensations. But I do believe there is too much complexity in front of the application developer today. And there is still a lot of room for pushing more into the platform. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Okay, so uh, let's go with the practical advice. For engineers just starting out in the field, what foundational knowledge or skills do you believe are essential? 
are you specifically asking for in the context of distributed systems or in the context of software engineering in general? Uh, I, I, I think software engineering in general, because like uh, every, everybody is reading some foundational things. Like, uh, I, I don't know, like my first serious book uh, on the on the software was, uh, was, was a book on the C language. Okay, so it, it mm -hmm. gave a lot about, you know, how memory works, how those pointers work. And, and so on and so on. Uh, what what do you think is uh, the most relevant right now? Not necessarily for the distributed systems. Ooh. That is a very, very, very difficult question to answer because I am so biased in that that I probably cannot shed my own bias, right? So uh, go but, ahead. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but I do believe, uh, so first off, it has been a long time um since i have worked on uh any front end it has been a very long time so i generally don't have um front end advice and on my talking points i focus on the back end but i do not at all want to discount uh the front end so not mentioning the front end is not that i want to say it's not important it's a very important part of any application so but on the back end side uh, I want to say, do understand uh, databases and uh, also do understand thinking in, right? Thinking in databases that goes beyond just understanding the API of a database, but understand what the database actually enables you to do. And we can talk about that if we have a, a little bit more time. And uh, for, um, so as a foundational piece, because most, most software, at the end of the day, right? The lowest layer is a database, right? Yeah, like, exactly. We're gonna touch the database. Yeah? Exactly, yeah. So uh, that's why understand the database is a big one. Yeah? When it comes to what kind of like programming language or what kind of uh, programming like paradigm, I don't have a good, uh, I don't have a good uh, answer to that. I don't, for example, hold C and its explicit memory management in higher regard than, for example, uh, JavaScript and uh, with its abstractions. But what I do suggest is whatever you're using, uh, be curious. Uh, be curious about the underlying mechanics of that. So because, for example, JavaScript, right? Um, if you look into the, uh, into the event queue of JavaScript, there's a whole universe in there. So a whole universe of macro tasks and micro tasks and promises and async awake and generators. There's a whole universe, right? So it's like, be curious about that universe. Don't let anybody tell you, ah, you're only a real programmer if you if you know C. Nah, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, um, but be curious about the runtime that you sit on top of because that itself is usually like uh, in um, a massive, like, success in engineering and has a lot of insights to offer so be curious about that yeah okay thank you very much for this advice okay uh how do you approach the trade-offs between consistency availability uh partition tolerance in real world applications the the good old cap theorem so it's like yes so we have the eternal conflict right of uh consistency versus availability in the presence of um, network partitions. But, um, and we all wield the cap theorem like a weapon, yeah? but uh, we all live with blunt force trauma yeah? because we, we in, in, there is no meeting yeah? where somebody doesn't bring out the cap and hits you over the head with it. But uh, the cap is one of these impossibility results that is actually fairly limited. Um, it only, says something about a um, linearizable read-write register uh, has a very narrow definition of availability uh, in the network in the presence of uh, network partitions. So first off, the first device is if anybody says cup or if you think cup, uh, all right, relax, lean back and think of if cup really applies to your situation. However, there is indeed yeah, a struggle or there is a, a bit of a conflict yeah, between high availability and low latency on the one side and consistency on the other. 
Now, how do we define consistency here? Not in the sense of linearizability, but in the sense of surprises. Yeah? And uh, surprises usually come when you read stuff. So that's why Pat Helen said reads are annoying. Yeah? And uh, so because the less uh, consistency, the more surprises you invite into your system, the less guarantees you have about this read. Is this the latest read? Right? Am I overriding somebody else's right now? Right? It's like, is this uh, the, the right order of things? Yeah? It's like, if I hit checkout now, uh, this is really the latest version of the, of the uh, shopping cart. So, but uh, yeah, so the balance between availability and latency on one side and consistency on the other very much depends on uh, your requirements and your ability and not now personal ability, but the ability of your system, your application domain uh, to cope with surprises. Can you cope with surprises? If you can, then invite more surprises in your system right? uh, for usually getting higher availability and higher uh, consistency. If you cannot, uh, you have to trade that off. And then uh, maybe you have to uh, uh, invite a higher latency and uh, lower availability in your, okay. your text. So data. what you're saying is, uh, it sounds to me like you, rather than two opposite things, like um, uh, you rather have a spectrum where you can go through very available, but very inconsistent thing to... Uh, much less available, but very consistent thing. And you can choose not from two points, but rather run on the spectrum between the two points and see like where your application belongs to, where it, where it brings the most value to the end user. Oh, very well articulated. Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, nice, we, we touched that. Okay, uh, what do you think, um, like with increasing reliance on distributed systems like uh, healthcare or finance or transportation, uh, like what considerations should we keep in mind? Because like if we screw up with uh, with a system in an airplane or in a medical system, then literally people die, right? So that should be approached carefully. Like how how should we approach that? So uh, that is a fantastic question. Um, this is, I think, is one of the questions that is not touched up, uh, uh, touched on enough. And uh, if you ask me, there is a uh, there, there immediately comes up the question of what is the system boundary? Yeah, and um, so general, generally, we view the system boundary as the uh, cyber physical system, right? So the system boundary is, for example, the airplane and the, the, that's the hardware and then the software in it, right? So, but it's not. The system boundary is a, a socio-technical system. We have to take people into account, right? Um, it's users, it's operators. We have to take that into account. Why is that so important? Uh, it's not for a spiritual argument uh, where we say we have to we have to understand how software and technical systems affect our lives. While that is true, right? Uh, I'm not trying to make that argument. I'm trying to make the end-to-end -end argument. And the end-to-end -end argument is uh, a fantastic argument. It's a great, great paper, highly recommended. Um, and uh, it argues that you can only guarantee correctness on the highest level of uh, the system. You can mitigate and completely mask some failures on lower levels, but um, the, in order to guarantee correctness, you actually have to go to the boundaries, to the highest layer of the system. And that is often where we also deal with humans, right? with users and operators. So we have to take that into account um, to uh, ensure that our systems uh, run uh, correctly, scalably, and uh, reliably. So we should include pilots and mechanics into the equation of the stability of the system in order to reason about any guarantees. 
for that exactly. And also, if you look at uh, the normal uh, software systems, we got to take uh, our developers, operators, and users all into account in order to get the most out of our systems. Because again, as the, the, um, the end to end argument dictates that we can only guarantee end to end guarantee on the endpoints of the system. Okay. Okay. Uh, very well. So we, we have some minutes left. So let's talk about uh, your book again and uh, proceed to, to the closing books. So uh, from your book, if there's like only one thing uh, a reader could uh, take away, what, what should it be? So my favorite there would still be the notion or the idea, accept many, many different mental models, right? So a lot of author or basically every author uh, has a slightly different mental model, right? And uh, for us, it's often, it was also very, very hard for me in the beginning yeah, when, we, when we start to acquire a mental model, we often really defend it, right? We said, no, no, it's not right when we are presented with a different mental model. Yeah. So, but try to see the world from the viewpoint of that author. Uh, first, like basically in the sense of open your mind, yeah, let go of your preconceived notion just for the moment, right? Follow the author and see the world through their lens. See what you can extract from it. See if that is like, yes, this is how I like to think. This is beneficial for me. I'm not saying you have to always adopt it, right? But make that effort to accept many, many different mental models. Because again, like the blind man and the elephant, you will see the whole thing much, much clearer. And then you can decide if you want to like include that particular way of thinking into your tool belt. Or if you say, no, this is not like my style. I like to think about systems differently and go back to your, to your other mental models. But um, don't like reflexively say, no, that's not right. Yeah, and it's like, because it contradicts your mental model. First, invite it. Then see where they maybe contradict because even there, there's something to be learned from because you may either extend your mental model or you may come to the conclusion and say, no, you know what, that author, I think uh, they are they're wrong. This is also fine, right? So it's like, there's, there's nothing wrong with that to then check your particular mental model, right? And have even more confidence in it because you saw like, no, that mental model of that author cannot reason about that uh, situation. But yeah, that is that is the biggest uh, biggest takeaway uh, that that I would hope people have that they are open for many many different ways of looking at uh, distributed systems. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, I think the last question is like uh, looking back: Is there anything that you would approach differently in writing the book or in your career around distributed systems? Oh, in my career, uh, for uh, sure. Uh, for the book, I will let you know once I complete it. But okay. uh, the the book, the good thing about the book is there's always the possibility of uh, second edition, right? So you can you can you can fix what you don't like in the first edition. Nice. But uh, for my for my career, I wish I really wish I looked at formal models sooner, especially TLA plus the temporal logic of actions and alloy, because again, they gave me a lens onto the world that um, was so sharp, so sharp. You, you see, uh, if you adopt a TLA brain or an alloy brain, you completely cut through the fog and through the noise. And I wish I did that much earlier. Yeah, formal models, I believe, is a super interesting and at the same time, very complicated topic. So we probably would uh, would record another another thing. Just speaking about the formal models, uh, I, I have a, I have a couple of other speakers that I would like to invite to, so we could probably I don't know host a panel about that. Would would be nice to do. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. Okay. So we ran out uh, out of time. Though so I enjoyed the conversation a lot, and uh, I, I learned several several new things. Uh, hopefully I will be able to, to cut some shorts out of this, you know, interview. So th they would be presented in a very granular way, very, oh, very cool. you know, con con condensed. Uh, so yeah, but at this point, thank you very much for your time. Uh, great interview, a lot of learnings. Uh, I wish you the success, uh, with, with you, with finishing your book. 
Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks to audience for attending. Uh, if you see this uh, this video and recording, please uh, write a comment down below. Like, what was the biggest learning from this interview here, so that we know that it was useful. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Have a nice day. Hey, Vladimir, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, uh, it was a pleasure for me. Thanks you. Uh, th thanks 